that brings us to our next topic, um, led by Tommy McElrath, um, talking about um, giving us some insights into managing natural history collections in taxon works. Um, Tommy, would you like to take it from there? Yeah. So before we get going here, um, I just want to take a quick poll. We're definitely going to be shifting perspectives here a little bit away from the whole open source idea to practically managing specimens in taxon works. Um, so just going to do a quick poll here in the chat. Um, who here is actively managing specimens or a whole collection in taxon works? Uh, put a plus one in the chat if you're doing something like that. So to clarify, you meant any collection, Tommy. You want to know yeah. who's managing in in a collection management CMS? Yes. In a, some sort of CMS, yeah. Lots of people. Here we go. All right. So yeah, definitely a lot of need there. Uh, definitely a lot of people doing that. So I think some of what I'm going to be talking about is going to be applicable to everyone because I'm going to be talking about a few things we put in place in our collection that involve taxon works, but some of these things don't, um, and they could be applicable to a bunch of different things or a bunch of different CMS systems. So I'm going to get sharing here. Um, uh, all right. So first thing. We have a, a, this is actually going to be put on GitHub relatively soon. Matt and I actually had to talk about this last week about moving this to be public. This is actually a private repository for issues and other data and some code that we've used to manage uh, the INHS insect collection data. And just to give a brief background about me, in case you didn't um, uh, hear me talk yesterday a little bit. I'm the insect collections manager of the Illinois Natural History Survey Insect Collection, which was one of the first uh, big collections to start using taxon works on a regular basis to manage collections data. So everything from loans to specimens to uh, collecting events, uh, photos, a lot of different things, containers, um, some of which we're still developing and uh, working on uh, getting that into uh, working on improving that in taxon works. Um, and so one of the things we did initially was start to track issues with data curation. And we're doing this right now in a GitLab repository, which is very similar to GitHub. It's got a lot of the same sort of things in terms of like issues and merge requests. So if you're familiar with GitHub at all, it's very similar. Um, and so if we go to some of our issues, um, uh, these are actually going to be public relatively soon, but you can see we've dealt with a lot of things. <laughs> um, this Some of these were the result of migrating our data from three different legacy systems, including Tomic or Pro, uh, uh, Microsoft Access, a, a SQL database. Um, but uh, it's everything from uh, adding different Darwin Core archives, adding um, some weird cross project, cross project project OTUs. This is a great way to just track everything that's going on with our data. Um, and a little bit of what we talked about before with that feedback URL that David was mentioning, I think fits really well in this. Um, I would love to see this become more public and have other people be able to contribute um, as well. Um, I think that's, that's something we talked about last week. But um, I'd like to talk about a little bit today is how we're starting to address those issues with some of the tools in taxon works, as well as some other data, we'll call them data quality, but you know, data validation, data um, improvement tools. Um, so this is the one that I have, I'm going to talk about the most right now. Um, when we initially migrated our data, um, there was a collecting event that was created that had over 20,000 different collection objects. And this was basically a junk bin collecting event for those objects that didn't have a, a real collecting event. We didn't just create a collecting event for it because in our old database, there was this locality called, basically it was called unknown um, or 74 was the number. And so when we migrated it, that was just migrated verbatim. And it turned out 
that a lot of specimens fit into that category of unknown. And so we've got 20,000 objects here that uh, very easily could be uh, have their data improved from literally nothing to uh, something, just anything. So if you look at that in Taxon Works, and for those of you who aren't familiar, this is a filter. Let me make this a little bit bigger. This is a filter in Taxon Works. So getting to a little bit of what Debbie showed earlier, you can filter a whole bunch of different things uh, in Taxon Works by all kinds of different ways, everything from geographic area to determinations. And this filter right now is filtered by a specific collecting event. So this is all the collection objects that are on this collecting event, that are associated with this collecting event. Um, so we still have 13,000 records, and this is after about three or four months of working on this off and on. Um, like has been mentioned before, uh, data improvement is not always at the top of everyone's priority list, and so uh, this hasn't been completely fixed yet. So you can see here, there's a lot left to go, 13,000 records, which we'd like to get off of this. Honestly, for, for a collection that has 1.1 million records being managed, only having 13,000 in some sort of unknown dumping bin isn't terrible, but using this filter, you can start to see, or at least I can start to see with some of the knowledge I have of our collection that a lot of these should be on a collecting event. Um, some of that is through some of the legacy data that was migrated. Um, so we have these buffered fields in TaxonWorks, which you can see, and they have a lot of numbers. So 3697 almost certainly refers to a accession number, um, which our, a lot of our data has instead of full verbatim label data, because um, that's all that's on the specimen is a number. Um, and we thankfully have those accession logs transcribed, and we have that data, but it needs to go on to the specimen. Um, some of these... Straurapol, Caucasus, that's probably someone not really knowing where that is, and that just needs to have individual attention. Uh, Northern Illinois, that is technically a collecting event, even if it's terrible data. Um, there's a lot of other things in here you could start to pull out. But I've got 13,000 of these records. I'm not going to go through them one by one, or at least I don't want to. Um, so one of the things we have now in Taxon Works is the ability to download all of these as a Darwin Core or as a CSV. Um, right now, I don't think the CSV can download 13,000. I think that's limited to the maximum you can actually pull here records. Um, but you can do this with the Darwin Core. So I'm going to go to the Darwin Core. I'm going to download this. And I'm going to include some of these, uh, some data attribute fields that were put on our collection objects when we migrated our database for for data validation purposes to make sure we didn't lose any data. So these are all duplicate fields of uh, hypothetically, um, you might recognize a lot of these as typical Darwin core, Darwin core type fields like country or county or state. We already have that elsewhere in the database. These are literally just duplicates of something that is already hypothetically in the database because we wanted to make sure that everything that was on previous objects got migrated. Um, we used to have a field called accession number label and special collection, and that is what I'm going to include on this. And I'm also going to include catalog number just to make sure that it matches what's currently in our system. So I'm going to go ahead and download that and uh, go to the Darwin Core dashboard. And you can see it's downloading a bunch of these. Um, what I'm going to do really quick is because I've already generated this, I don't want to have to wait. I'm actually going to go back <clears throat> to some of the ways I've looked at this data before and tracked it. And there's a whole bunch of history here, but I've already isolated about 10,000 records that are likely linked to those INHS accession uh, fields, uh, INHS accession books, because they had um, that accession number label in a data attribute in their, already added to their object. Um, so, uh, I'm actually going to use this Darwin Core download. I just downloaded it a few minutes ago. And I'm going to use something called Open Refine. So uh, just to make this a little bit faster, um, I'm going to show you how you would do this and then uh, go back to what I've already generated so it takes a little less time. But basically, OpenRefine is a data visualization tool that has a few more powerful tools than something like Excel or Apple Numbers. 
Um, I'm not going to give an overview of Open Refine because that will take a long time, and there are other people who do it much better, like Debbie Paul um, or uh, a bunch of other uh, data quality groups. Um, but it looks like this. It runs in a web browser, um, and I'm going to choose that file that I've already downloaded. Uh, here was the Darwin core that was generated from Taxon Works. Here's me expanding it. And here's the TSV uh, tab separated value file that was generated. And I can open this and it will quickly give me a little preview of how it's going to parse it and create it. All right, it looks like a table. Great. And then I would hit create project. Uh, so I did that for uh, this already. Um, and what you can see here is that basically what looks like a spreadsheet um, with a lot of the fields that I downloaded. Here's that data attribute catalog number. Here's the actual catalog number that was generated from it. You can see 778 and 778, they match, great. Um, and you can also see verbatim label and accession number label. There's that data attribute I mentioned before. And what you can do is you can go in and do something called a text facet. So let's do verbatim label just for example. So it's going to go through all uh, six, seven, or 67,000 records and give me a quick summary of everything that's in there. And I'm going to summarize these by count. And it looks like in verbatim label, there is not a lot of similar uh, data. Um, it's grouping these by count right now. It looks like a lot of them just says 74 unknown, maybe some Geralt debt. Here's a few accession numbers that I can do. But I've already had gone and done this for accession number label. Um, and so this field was put in in our old database to indicate that this was an INHS accession book number. Um, and just for fun, I'm going to show you uh, what that looks like. Um, here are all of our scanned accession books. Here's what it looks like on our specimens. It's basically just a typed or handwritten number that looks kind of like this. Um, and here is what those accession books look like. Here's a scanned one. It's on archive.org. Uh, some of these are also in Biodiversity Heritage Library. Um, but here's the actual data. And we have already gone through and transcribed this mostly in our database. It's not perfect. Um, but most of these numbers are already in our database as collecting events. And you can see stuff like this was collected in Chicago on September 18th, 1908. Collector is J.J. Davis, stuff like that. But uh, using OpenRefine, I can generate a list of all of these numbers and how many times they're used um, in the database. Um, so I can go through quickly and select all of the ones that have multiple values. Um, so I've gone through and just pre-selected those to save time. I'm just going to select all the ones that have over 10. And I'm going to re-download -down that as a CSV. Um, to just have the ones that have a lot of ones that I can quickly chew through. So we'll generate a CSV. I am going to open this in, uh, I use Apple numbers. Uh, it's not Windows, thankfully. It doesn't auto parse anything uh, or auto change any dates. And not like I'm actually going to upload this or use this for that. Um, but I'm quickly going to sort by that accession number field. If it would let me sort sending. There we go. I've got those. I've got the catalog numbers I need to edit. Um, I could filter this if I want to, but I find it easier to just uh, grab a bunch of numbers, and you'll see why in a second. So now that I've downloaded this back in a slightly different form from OpenRefine, I can go to a different task in TaxonWorks. This is called Collection Object Match. And I will note that you can actually get here right from filters. Uh, where did my folders go? There we go. So if I wanted to, I can get right from here. Let this load real quick. If I select any number of fields, any number of records, I can get right to this from this little, uh, I believe it's this linker, radio linker. And you can get right to this from here. So if I wanted to, I could send these three records to here and do this task. I'm not going to use these three records, but um, talk about that in a second. So instead, I'm going to open that task blankly, have my uh, records over here on the left, or on the right, sorry. Just get it a little easier to see. Um, all right, so I know that all of these catalog numbers have 
the accession number label of 10806. Copy those, dump them in here, match, select all of them, collecting event, grab that number, put it in here, searches, uh, finds it in the database. Um, I know it, this INHS ledgers one right here. Uh, it was apparently collected by Stephen Forbes, who was our founder back in 1886. Gonna set that. And boom, those however many records, uh, what is that? 13 records, those were all updated. Okay, so instead of going through this one by one, I just updated 13 records all at once to have that as the collecting event. So there's 13 records. So now I can just refresh. I don't even technically have to refresh. I like to do it to help me remember. I'm gonna grab the next set of records, pop those in, match those, select all of those, and do the exact same thing. So for those of you with coding or API experience, this might look like not the most efficient way to do this. But the problem is, is that every single one of these numbers requires a little bit of human validation. Not much, but just choosing between, OK, is this a Robertson ledger or an INHS ledgers one is requires a little bit of foreknowledge. Um, we've actually already gone through and done all the Charles Robertson ones. That was another 3,000 records. And here's the INHS ledgers ones. So only three uses right now. But once I set it, all these will get that set as their collecting event. There we go. And rinse and repeat. So doing this, I could very easily churn through 1,000 records in less than an hour. Um, for all the Charles Robertson ones, this download wasn't working exactly right about two months ago. And so we did all of those individually, one by one. Um, we did that from a filter, uh, which I keep going off of for some reason. You can do that. It's not terribly hard, but each one takes just a little bit of time. So for example, this one, um, I can quickly go to comprehensive, which I showed off yesterday. Pop that one open. See, okay, 212, that's probably an INHS accession number. Put that in the collecting event. Put it in there. Save it. All right, that one's done. So you can see how each one requires just a little bit of human feedback. Tommy, you know you can use the object radial on the row, row by row to, you don't have to jump here. You're right. I don't. Yeah. Yeah. So you can so, also do, yeah. is it this one? No. No, the, the one in the middle. One in the middle. So I could also yeah. do it this way, go to the collecting event, and is that supposed to be looking That, that doesn't way? look right, does it? No. <laughs> but uh, you can I'll still select that one. Let's see here. So 15,000, uh, four, let's go here, collecting event. Okay. Get rid of that one, pull that up. So you could also do it this way. So there's a number of different ways to improve this. But the one I showed seems to be the fastest way to do it in bulk, at least right now. Um, so that one just got fixed as well. And so you can see uh, this is what it was before. If I filter this again, you'll see this number go down because it's removing them from that collecting event. You see, I just fixed two records. And I fixed about 20 right before that. So that number is going down. So that's one kind of improvement I can do. So in this task, you can see that you can fix a lot of different things. Um, you can fix uh, and add bulk determinations. You can add accession information. Um, you can fix uh, or add tax on determinations. Uh, you can add things or take things. Actually, right here, you can't take them off of loans. There's another way to do that. Um, you can fix preparation types, add repository data, or add tags. There are a number of things that you cannot do in this task, but you can actually do through filters, though. Um, so that is what I've been doing a lot lately, is basically finding ways to improve my data through filters. And literally, the stuff that Debbie talked about earlier came out last week, um, that project summary um, and a few other things. So I've, I've only just started to explore other ways to improve our data through that. Um, we could show that off a little bit if people wanted to. At this point, I wanted to open it up to Q&A um, to ask, to let people ask um, 
what uh, they would like to see or see if there are um, questions about uh, things like that. <laughs> the curse 74 exists in all our leg legacy data to this. Yeah. Um, I think one of the other questions we had talked about, Tommy, was from a very practical standpoint for others, hopefully this resonated, this kind of process, you know, might not have been exactly the same in other CMSs, but I think we all do this kind of thing. Are there simple things that you wish the developers would hear you mm -hmm. and and build in your CMS, not just TaxonWorks? Feel free in the chat or to, to raise your hand and point out like, if they just did X, uh, this would be mm -hmm. wonderful. There's an opportunity for that now too. So there's, there is one thing that I realized just like during this conference, um, so Debbie has, uh, helped build that great project summary test. Did I favorite that yet? I did not. Um, project vocabulary, sorry. That's what it's called. Um, I can't select data attributes yet, or at least I can, but the ones that I have are not in here yet. So we could do this without open refine, but I can't figure out how to, yeah. uh, add data attributes or find so I, like, there's this right here but then it only has these things not the data attributes that we've added um so i could be doing this that way um just by clicking them on there and then sending them to collection object match but we can't do that just yet because we don't have these findable yeah understood. Um, but yeah what else, what would other people love to see i'd be very curious uh debbie has your hand up i do but i let me wait for others. Anybody else want to jump in? Ah, yeah. Um, so I would like to point out a comment. There's a sort of back conversation going on. And, and I think we have a way forward. So, so what I want to talk about is how, when we are fixing these kinds of things in our own systems, are there opportunities, and, and I think Fritz hinted at this earlier too, if I understood where he was going. Are there opportunities to do these things in a way using tools or software that we write that can help each other? So one concrete example would be we have specimens, let's say from the same collector, like Her Herbaria have this where they have duplicates, right? And so you want a system where if I've fixed the date on that thing or I've georeferenced it, why does somebody have to do it again at the other places? So that's one level. Mm -hmm. The other level would be the gbifference tool that we built. This notion of instead of having you, the collection manager, or data manager, or data steward, having to go to the aggregator and get those CSV files and bring them back into your software, how can we build a tool so that you could use what we built and it just uh, pulls that back in for you? Um, we are experiencing the same problems. We're solving the same problems, but in lots of different ways. And are there ways in which we could help each other with that? I, I'm, I'm not sure. And I would ask you to elaborate on that if you can think of ways in which we could yeah. sort of improve I have, it for everyone. I have one quick response. Um, I know the gbifference tool is in here and I've used it on an individual record basis. And I can see the data quality flags of our data on gbif, but there is no way to visualize in bulk across the whole collection what gets changed for gbifference. Like I wanna see all of the records where this sort of thing got changed in all of my data um, Tommy, could you go into GBIF, download the those records? They'll all have their occurrence ID, and you can use the match functionality either in the filter or and do sort of what you're doing, except with the records flagged in that sense. Yes, and I have done that. Uh, at least I've tried to do that in the past before we had some of these bulk edit tools, and I couldn't fix a lot of things. Um, yeah, there's a lot so, more bulk edit possible now. Yeah. I think um, that's something so that I envisioned, I've, I've Tommy. Go ahead. Debbie. So I envisioned what you said at some point with the soft validation that we have uh, mostly enabled for nomenclatural data. Mm -hmm. For those of you who don't know, we have this sort of 
uh, the rules of nomenclature are built into the software so that it helps people get things like taxon name endings right. Like they have a hard time getting them wrong because the software won't let you. And so we would like to do the same thing with that gbifference. I can imagine that Tommy goes to a record and he looks at an individual specimen record and GBIF has asserted that the lat lawn are flipped. And he could say, okay, I can fix this one record, but I'd really like to know what other records have the same issue. And so analogous to the soft validation we already have, we would add to it where you could click on that and it would then gather all the records for you. Matt alluded to another way you can still do that. If you did get the GBIF downloaded, you get all the IDs and use those to search your own records to, like you just saw Tommy do. I think that um, I'm trying to say like figuring out if we have open source products, um, you can see their code, you can see what we're doing. It's the gbifference tool. I think if I'm not mistaken, and I don't know if anybody from Specify is here, I think they did take our code. They took our code that we wrote to go pull those data from gbif back into the system and added that same functionality using our code um, to make that possible inside spinach. But it, I, I'm sorry, inside specify. What I'm trying to say there is it, I think that we are looking at, oh yeah, sorry, I see your comment too, David. How do we promote the idea of helping each other? How, how could that actually happen? And, and uh, I'm not sure yet either. That's one example. And I think David just pointed out another, um, Tommy, that you were pointing out in the comment there, that you were yeah. trying to look at maybe perhaps progress, right? Yes, exactly. I think, yeah, David yeah. hit it on the nose in the chat there. Um, progress is a great way to think about it. Um, right now in the filters, we have all these different ways of looking at what you could call um, uh, data completeness. Um, so things with or without depictions, things with or without dates, things with or without determiners or geographic areas assigned um, or identifiers or prep types. So I can do all of those searches individually, um, but I cannot look right now across the whole project and see, oh, here is a set of things that do not have those. Um, I, I can't, I, I want to be able to see more of those all at once and see groups of things that I can edit to improve data quality. Um, and it could even just be broken down by the things in here, like with or without this, with or without this, it's just a series of bars. Um, or, or we can create an index of whether this record is uh how how complete or it, it's hard to say whether something is complete or not right um you have to assert that somewhat as a collection manager or as someone who's looking at the data but um i can very easily see in comprehensive uh when a record is done because i can see okay this these fields are all filled out there are no other fields for me to fill out this record should be marked as complete um, whereas right now I can't see that in bulk across a lot of things. So for right now, so a great example right now, I'm here in the filter. Here are, uh, 3,900 records of specimens that are from Champaign County, um, that do not have that geographic area assigned to it. So when they get exported, that is inferred rather than asserted. Um, and I can, yeah, I can start to edit that, but. Uh, I'm going to send this to the collecting event filter, see all the collecting events that match those qualities, um, and I can start to assert that. But that's one example out of many sorts of things. I can't hear you, Debbie. Uh, okay. Tommy, one of the things you, you alluded to while this is loading, I see. Mm -hmm. that I mentioned in my talk that I think is huge. My perception is that it's usually important. I would be interested to hear other people's perception. So I know that at least through IDIC Bio, a lot of the TCNs that got funded chose to use this so-called skeletal record or minimal data capture approach. 
So imagine your own self, Tommy, you know, with your own grant where you've decided to do such a thing. And I know there's people, Symbiota, Arctos, others that have chosen to do something similar. Thinking about how do you track the records that were part of that particular project? We still don't have a field in Darwin Core that really lets you assert this record captured as part of this grant. We can stick mm -hmm. it in a sort of general bucket, but it's not a specific. You can do that in taxon works, but you can't. There's no Darwin yeah. So, so the, the point I'm making here is, in terms of institutional memory and completing records, you know, here's all these records I know were only captured to this level. And I know they need to move up a notch. This gets at the mid standards that our cat might be able to speak more mm -hmm. about if we have questions about mids. I think she's still here. Um, how do we know in our own databases and how do we pass that knowledge on, right? If we move on to a different institution, if we change jobs, et cetera, um, yeah. So, so how how can we pass that information on? Kat, would, can you speak to how MIDS could help that if we had that engaged in our data sets? Um, yeah, could you like rehash the context um, sure. of, of the question? I think the, the question here is sort of like, how do you know your data? How do you know the completeness of it? How do you know the consistency of it? How do you know what needs to be worked on? How do you know your progress? And so I was thinking the mids level is kind of a way to say, well, if it's a mids level one record, it's not georeferenced. Or if it's a mids level two record, it has this, but not that or something. Can mids help with that? Right. I mean, in theory, yeah, mids could absolutely help with that. I mean, mids is a measure of, you know, what, what Elspeth and I have been calling it is data richness, not so much data mm -hmm. quality, just because quality can't, we can't automatically enforce that. We can't, we can't enforce that by a machine, right? Um, you know, but at the end of the day, the data are only as good as they're they're only as good as I, I can't say this without like talking in circles, but you know, the data are only as good as the data that you put in. You know, so you could have a, a mids level three, which is like, you know, totally complete and ideally an extended specimen, right? But if all like all of the fields are satisfied technically, but if it's all garbage data, then yeah, it could be mids level three, but it could it could be a poor quality of mids level three specimen, right? I mean, I'm speaking very generally here and kind of off the cuff, um, you know, but to back out of my you know pessimistic hole here, uh, yeah, I think mids could, once it's implemented, be useful in determining levels of completeness and digitization, because that's the general idea. It's like, how complete are the data? Not how, not the level of fidelity, but the level of completeness, like how many fields are are filled out basically. Does that answer the question? Yeah. I think so. I think I'm, I'm trying to just say there's different ways in which we can take this on. And you pointed out some of the nuances. We can't, you know, talking about these topics, they are, you try to put your thumb on it and say, oh, this is going to take care of it. And all of a sudden it slips out from under your thumb. You can't, can't quite pin it all that, all the aspects down. Um, yeah, that, I, I guess the main point that I'm making is, you know, we have all of these, you know, all these rules, all these algorithms, all these, you know, these things that you know, they're very useful tools. And, you know, if and when they're implemented, they'll be, you know, immensely useful and just, you know, gauging how far along a collection is digitized, right? But at the end of the day, it cannot replace human beings and their human mm -hmm. eyeballs and their human brains yeah. looking at the data and confirming that, oh, yes, this makes sense. This is usable and this is truthful. Yeah. And, Tommy, and I think, you... Sorry, go ahead, Debbie. No, I was to finish the thought with saying um, the idea here is that I'm suggesting what are the ways in which we can help Tommy and others see what needs to be done. And so these different tools, these different ways of visualizing your data, different ways of pivoting around it to help you um, do this data fidelity task if we want to adopt Erica's way of addressing this topic. Um, Matt, you wanted to make a suggestion? Yeah, I was just thinking, Tommy, we have a, I mean, one of the conceptual things would be, could you just fire open the staged image processor as a visualizer, kind of meta visualizer idea? Like the staged image filter and just open it to the first page or to some uh, page. I mean, yeah, let me show you Do that. So we have a digitization process that parses staged images, um, a workflow that we developed out of a grant maybe seven years ago. And it involves using a gridded out image to assign simple metadata to that image and then um, gives you a first step in, in processing through those images into those 
buffered or sort of verbatim fields that Tommy was pointing. But here's the, the concept here was just that, you know, Tommy talked about having some kind of mids. This is a taxon works staged image mid kind of idea with those cells forward. And so you can see that you can sort globally on all of those things at the bottom. You can say with or without, and you can get some set that you wanted to focus on and then keep breaking down the data in that in that way. So there's yeah. there are some of those meta concepts and you know visualization experiments that I played with um, possible. Um, I mean, even yeah, something and, as simple as, so the, the problem with this is that it's just for things that have images. Yeah, yeah, right. So <laughs> so the question is, is maybe the, the devil's advocate is, do we ever really want to play with the whole data set? And I think what we're saying is that there is probably what we want to identify is not, we want to identify the, the fewest changes that will impact the most records for the most mm -hmm. good. And we want to mm -hmm. tackle that list for first. And so Tommy, when the other tool we had was the, um, uh, where's the one where we fixed it and you fixed thousands of determinations. Uh, we added thousands of determinations by grouping the verbatim and then, you know, they were all the same. So mm. we could immediately mm -hmm. apply all the determinations at once. It's those suites of tools that, that, that find where very few actions can impact the data quality in, in a huge way. So here we had an, uh, here we have the ability to capture verbatim determination data. And here in the original data, we had, you know, 2000 verbatim strings. Tommy has whittled it all the way down so that here. So now, for example, the top row there is a verbatim string of text. And we want to turn that into a role that's linked to basically exactly what Bionomia is doing, a person that has an ORCID ID. And so here you can assign eight objects at the same time and break it down into a composed, um, uh, individuated determination all at once. And so this was, again, this grouping of records and making them actionable all at one time um, is, is the sort of idea that we're thinking of that we want to then extrapolate across all of our data sets. And it might be that, you know, one of the axes is that there's a verbatim determination and others axis is that there is missing a collecting event and another axis is, you know, something else. How do we see that space? that's sort of on fire, the heat map that overlays all these axes that shows us where we can get that cluster of overlapping sets of metadata and then act on those really quickly to improve. Exactly. So, it's, yeah, basically, yeah, we need more tools. Yeah. Yeah. I think more more I'm getting more onto this more tools. when I hear the, the Aussies, they talk about being Moorish, which I laugh, mm -hmm. but so I mean, this you notion know, of, you know, yeah. How do you know Tommy now, and how would anybody in the future know who's not you? Um, know that there's moreness to be had, that there is yeah. this verbatim field or buffered field or other field verbatim label, or some minimal capture where you know the label has more information that hasn't been captured yet. Um, how do you know that, and and what are the ways in which you could know that? Uh, to Two minutes. Efforts? Yeah, so I think we're I think we have some wonderful examples. You're looking at one of them. You saw the project vocabulary. Um, you saw the field sync that is going to have crazy consequences to what we can do for batch updating. Um, and these interfaces are sort of where these ideas. It's the you know origin of the pool of where sort of life evolved for answering and exploring how those. A lot of these things we have ideas for, but when it gets down to building an interface or building the compute behind things. Um, when you operate on a million records by a million record by you know 40 variables you you need to think about how that's going to be calculated in the background how it's going to be updated etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, so it's a real it's a fun challenge and we have a good background here i think uh in place to, to explore that world and to quickly iterate on new interfaces and new approaches yeah um i'm, I'm really looking forward to playing more with the project vocabulary tool just as a way to visualize that. I think that's a great step, first step as well, just looking at different groups of data and seeing what's what's out there. Um, and some of the other uh, some of the other data quality tools that are also out there. So yeah, I think we're moving in some really good directions. Um, and just a quick shout out. Um, I will say too, like I've been asking for 
uh, some of these like bulk edit tools for a while, um, and they're still being improved. But uh, I just want to shout out the Ant Web people and, and Dash and Brian for also asking for them and helping uh, to move those move those forward. Um, so thanks, guys, if you're here or not. But even if they're not, I could thank them too. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you, Tony. I'd like to add, just thinking again, sharing. Some of you have heard this, but others it will be new to you. Uh, Dimitri, is your hand up? Oh, no, I saw the icon, sorry. Um, the potential in these tools expands when we think about verbatim label, which is maybe, Tommy, we put that link in the chat again to the term, but once these data, verbatim data, get out to the level of GBA phonetic bio, I, I see a lot of potential there for this sort of indexing and discovery. So if you were searching for Charles A, Burge or whatever I had earlier in my example, and you didn't have it atomized yet, if it went out in the verbatim label, then somebody who's searching that at GBIF or people like Nikki Nicholson and Tim Robertson and others who've worked on clustering algorithms for GBIF, those records will find each other then without, bef well, before you actually manage to get Charles Burge into the field for determiner. Uh, and not to mention the concept of AI finding those records and saying, hey, these things are probably related. I think the other part of that for me, Tommy, that you just raised is the potential, I'm not sure at what level, because I know this is hard, easy to say, but hard, is just like you saw in project vocabulary where you get clusters, you get all the, here's all the things. It would be cool to do things like add fuzzy matching to that because there could be a typo, right? You want to see, like you do in Open Refine, these things are probably the same or very close. The other thing you'd, I'd love to see is the ability to sort of, especially at the level of the aggregator, perhaps um, dive down in it. So if I search for a certain string and it finds me all the records with that or something very close, then I would like it to come back and say, in your data set, here are some more clusters. Cluster could be a single word or it could be a string and say, you know, I found in the records, I gave you back 200,000 records, but I found 50 records with this string. I found 450 records with this other string. So it helps you see patterns in the data that you might not ever look for on your own. And it, it, through that visualization, same thing. It's like a searchable word cloud that allows you to go for layers, layers upon layers upon layers, right? Yeah. Um, if you look at our word cloud for, I know we're running out of time, but for verbatim collectors, um, you can just start to go down and see, oh, there's people appearing over and over again. Here's H.H. H. Ross. Oh, here's H.H. H. Ross. Oh, here's H.H. H. Ross. Oh, look, there's H.H. H. Ross. It's like they just keep going and going. Um, and that's not necessarily because they're even typed. It's because they're appearing in different groups. And this is like a little bit of the binomia thing, but also a little bit of duplication um, and yeah, having clustering algorithms as well would help find some of those things. And then not, not just for collectors. I mean, Bionomia does a great job of helping to D um, or helping to, oh my gosh, blanking on the words. Uh, disambiguate. That's the word, disambiguate those. Um, but there's other ways we could do that. Things like habitat or um, other areas that need that sort of looking at habitat or method or things like that. So anyway. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much, Tommy and Debbie for leading that session. I think we have one more um, little contribution for this morning before we wrap up. And that's um, the brave soul uh, Ming, who's offered to do a three minute one slide and a reminder that there'll be one more opportunity to do three minute one slide. If you'd like to present your challenges or uh, your sort of use case or your research in three minutes, you can do that. And Ming has gratefully uh, or thankfully taken us up on that offer and would like to present um, some work. Yes, hello world. I'm Ming. I manage interactive biodiversity data. Uh, I recently, so I know Texan works for a while now, but I recently tasked to manage a, a scientific expedition data. Um, so I, when I saw Taxon Works, I thought, wow, the data types that's supported by Taxon Works and how flexible the models are. I, I'm curious whether Taxon Works can be used to manage 
um, data from scientific expedition. So this example here is an, is an Antarctic expedition from the Belgian team. Um, the objective is to estimate tipping points in habitability of Antarctic benthic ecosystems under global future climate change scenario. So this is what happened. There are a group of 10 to 12 scientists to go on a sailboat to Antarctica. They collect samples there. They start doing data management and started conducting some of the experiments um, and measurements there without internet. And so some of the examples of data that I will get is, so there are drones and underwater remote operating vehicles that take aerial footage and underwater benthic habitat footage. These are imagery data. And the, the rafts will also measure salinity, seawater temperature and depth. Then this will be used for one university to, as, uh, to assess the in-situ benthic community, uh, community. And then there's another group of scientists who will do of sea ice coring, sediment, uh, sea ice coring, and then also to collect seawater together with the phytoplankton to estimate the grass primary production. There will also be sediment traps and collect sediment sample. And they will look at the taxonomic isotopic biomass composition and to study the vertical flux to the seafloor. And then there are dedicated divers that collect key species. Um, for all of the species, not all of the species, but some of them, they will also split them up into multiple parts. For example, the spine of the sea urchin will go for DNA barcoding. The intestine and digest digestion pellet will be used for microbiome analysis. This goes to another, um, the, uh, the yellow university. And then the uh, Aristotle lantern, that's basically the mouth part of sea urchin, will be used for stable isotope ratios analysis. And the gonads will also be used for sex identification. They will also take picture of the sea urchin. So these are all range of data types and measurements um, that from this scientific expedition. So the problem and the challenge that I have is um, the structural funding that we have for this is zero. So we are using Dropbox. So some people are using Dropbox, some people are using Google Drive. And at some point, um, the identifiers and data get inconsistent and it's really difficult to manage. And the other challenge that I personally feel is a challenge for me is the, the, the scientists, the researchers, they are tracking the samples, but to publish this data in a fair manner to Dribbuff and Obis and other aggregators, it has to be occurrences which is an artificial concept um, and having the requirement, you know, to be able to have occurrence ID to be stable. And I, I, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping that Taxon works because under Taxon works, there's collecting even and collection objects and there's like export into occurrences. I'm hoping that this feature could help to track both occurrence ID and the sample ID. I don't know if that makes sense, but um, so these are the two challenges that I hope to address. Um, yeah, I think this is all. Thanks, uh, Ming. Should I? Thank yeah. you. I think, I think conceptually, this is a plug for next year as well. Um, but we're going to hopefully keep having that conversation next year. I think we will also have one of another concept uh, anatomical part will be added to the system. So this chain between specimen and part and part and part and part or specimen and part and extract any network of that combination of things will be represented all with uh, UUIDs on any element um, and including this. We have a special origin relationship that can, we can assert between those. So that's a quick way of saying, I think we can represent the data, but I think you have a bigger challenge in how you're socially going to use the platform. And we had a conversation in the past couple of weeks about 
um, you know, you go offline to the Arctic and then you bring your data back online and you want to merge taxon marsh projects. So what I'm saying is I think we can represent your data, but I'm not sure if we can, we, we have work to do to um, merge those representations, to merge the social interactions on those data at various different parts. And that's a really good grand challenge to figure out how to do that. But conceptually, I think Taxon Works really nicely aligns its data models to what you want to do. Um, and I think in the next year, we should have this exact same. You're gonna have, let's please come and do a full talk from now till next year on 15 minutes, we'll have a symposia as to where we got, right? And in our improvements here and to trace this, it might be a nice idea. Um, because I think things like containerization, anatomical parts, some of the things that we're going to highlight tomorrow are on the agenda for this year, and they'll resonate with you. Whether or not you get used in that context, we don't know, but um, it's an exciting time to have that conversation. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Like, like I'm really, um, I'm curious, like how these things would work, and I would test it with the data, and I'm happy to provide input and feedback um, to you if that's useful. And what did I want to say? Yes. So um, I'm at the moment, I'm also looking at some other systems like how the Norwegian manage the Arctic expedition. Maybe there could be ways to not use taxon works fully, but couple it with the sample logger from um, the Norwegian systems. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, that's that's what I have in mind. I don't know. I, I need to experiment it. But um, I just want to say that thank you so much for all the works that you guys have been doing. Mm -hmm. So it's a really, really great. Thank project. you for your input and for just engaging it. Even if nothing, you know, locks in, it's great to understand. And, and really, when I first saw your slide, what got me the most excited about it is that this is real life things happening right now. We don't have to imagine anything about the needs, about data quality, et cetera, here. We have to imagine how to better facilitate tracking simple samples over time in diverse situations. And to me, this is a very practical example that I would love to see TaxonWorks focus at, at least that class of problems. Um, we can imagine many other things like, how can AI help this problem? Right? I don't know, I, but I'm pretty sure we can. We have some bigger fundamental simple things to fix that um, we need to get in place. Not to say first, but you know, that we can think about um, as a priority. So good stuff. I like practical problems. I think that's it, Debbie, for today. A big thank you to Ming and everybody who contributed. Uh, Really fantastic session. We had a lot of people stick with us throughout the whole morning. Um, tomorrow we'll be back. We'll have a, a focus a bit more on developers. And first thing we have to do is find and install um, the shoot pattern. When you open it, um, okay. Uh, <laughs> maybe uh, maybe Filippo meant to talk. Filippo closed yeah. his mic, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so yeah, tomorrow there'll be lots of chat time for chat as well. Uh, the three sessions that are there are going to be largely good, like we'll introduce a couple topics and then we're just going to have conversation as well. Um, there'll be the rewards. No worries. Well, there'll be an award session at the very end. So come to see um, and yep. to celebrate the community members that yep. have made cool contributions. Debbie, what else have we got? I just, I want to reiterate to people so they uh, feel welcome. There is a developer focused conversation. We want to emphasize, quote, everyone can be a developer. You can yeah, contribute that's in really different important. ways. So uh, come hear more. It's sort of in some ways a continuation of kind of what got started and some of the questions that got raised today with Martin Treckles. Uh, about this, the present and future milestones uh, for our open source effort, and so we should say, yeah, it's a really good distinction. It's not necessarily developer; it's developments. And you heard Tommy talk about, you know, working with us and thanking Brian and Dash, and really we depended on Tommy, and we all depend on each other to come up with these ideas, to to develop workflows, to develop processes, to develop the interface that glues that together. That's not just, you know, people in isolation coming up with ideas. That's that's really a challenging discussion, and that's what tomorrow was about. How you can all contribute uh, to that development process. 
And that follows up with some uh, show and tell where, where we're talking about different functionalities we've built that allow you to take advantage of using R, or Ruby, or Python, and Refine uh, to use and query your data in, in Taxon Works and, and other tools like global names, for example. Uh, we have three minutes, one slide again. So if you were inspired today by Ming's presentation about her particular use case, or you have your own question or ideas that you'd like to share that were brought up by what you've heard or didn't hear, uh, there's an opportunity for you. Just let me or Matt know um, that you'd like to do that. And we also have a conversation tomorrow about integrating the Taxon Works experience into a taxonomy course. And this is a broader conversation brought to us. Uh, Elspeth Haston from the Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh reached out and said, I'd like to talk about this. She has a goal to include sort of state of the art and forward thinking uh, resources into the experiences that her students can have while they're taking a taxonomy course. So she's going to share her vision and we'll talk about that. Um, Matt, you wanna talk about our collective geospatial future? What's that gonna be like? Um, that's going to be a little off the cuff. We've faced, for those of you who are familiar with us, we've faced a number of, you know, challenges that have been addressed or touched on in tangent. And um, really, I'm going to present a couple of uh, um, sort of use cases or things we experimented or experienced in the, in the last year or two or, or three. And again, it's just going to be an open conversation about the challenges of providing geospatial context for our collection objects. Where do we have um, cool things to show off now? What do we struggle with at the developer level, at the user level? Um, so again, an open conversation that starts with a couple of highlights of some of the challenges or some of the things that we're thinking of in the future. 